Continuous flow gas lift, a Shell Oil Company training course for operating personnel. The view from the surface of a well that is on continuous flow gas lift serves to introduce what this film is about. Gas lift is an artificial lift method in which the gas to liquid ratio of the well is artificially increased by injecting gas into the tubing. The addition of the gas causes the well to perform as a flowing well. There is no jetting or lifting as such, but simply a reduction in the pressure on bottom due to the gas injection. This discussion will not cover intermittent gas lift because it's a totally different type of lift method. To understand how gas lift works, certain principles must be grasped. To begin our discussion, first note this schematic of a simple well situation. The well is 1,000 feet deep and produces salt water. There is two inch tubing inside five and a half inch casing and the tubing pressure to be held is 50 PSI. The salt water in the well gives a static liquid gradient equal to 0.45 PSI per foot of depth. In other words, for every foot of depth, the salt water will exert 0.45 pounds per square inch of pressure. Also, this 1,000 foot well has a static reservoir pressure in the producing sand equal to 500 PSI. Finally, the well has a productivity index of one barrel per day per PSI drawdown. That is, for each PSI that the pressure is reduced at the bottom of the hole, one barrel per day of salt water will be produced. The well in this static condition is standing full of water in both the tubing and the casing. There is 50 PSI pressure on both the tubing and the casing, and at the bottom of the hole there is the 50 PSI tubing head pressure, plus the gradient pressure. The gradient pressure is equal to 450 PSI over a thousand foot depth. This means that there is exactly 500 pounds at the bottom of the hole, because 0.45 times 1,000 plus 50 equals 500. This 500 pounds of pressure held against the producing reservoir is exactly equal to the static reservoir pressure. Therefore, no flow can occur. No production is being made. This static no flow condition can also be shown on a graph. The tubing head pressure of 50 PSI is shown on the top or pressure line of the graph. The salt water gradient pressure is traced from the 50 PSI tubing pressure to 1,000 feet at the bottom. The pressure equals 500 PSI at 1,000 feet. Since the static reservoir pressure is also 500 PSI, no flow can occur. Now suppose there is a source of high pressure gas that can be injected into the casing tubing annulus. Using a small choke, the gas is injected very slowly into the annulus, as shown in yellow on the drawing. The tubing is hanging open-ended or with a perforated nipple at the bottom of the hole. It should be pointed out here that the gas column in this example has a static gradient equal to 0 0.01 PSI per foot of depth. The gas gradient is dependent upon temperature, pressure, and gravity of the gas but we will use 0 0.01 for all pressures. Also, the gas gradient is not particularly important in this case, since a gas column from the surface to total depth of 1,000 feet increases the pressure only 10 PSI. When gas pressure is applied to the casing tubing annulus, the water level in the annulus is depressed, causing the water to flow in a U-tube manner. It flows down the casing and back up the tubing this is not water produced from the formation, but is simply water being unloaded out of the casing, up the tubing, and out at the surface. By the time the water level is depressed to 500 feet in the casing tubing annulus, about 10 barrels of water has been produced out of the tubing, as shown on the drawing at left. Also, the pressure on the casing tubing annulus will have built up to about 270 PSI, as shown on the drawing and the graph at right. The pressure against the sand face has not changed and still remains at 500 PSI. Since the gas is being bled into the casing annulus at a low rate, the flow of water down the casing and up the tubing 
creates only a negligible amount of friction drop. This is normally the case in field operations where gas is put through a small choke or needle valve into the casing. There is no control over what the gas pressure in the casing annulus is. Only the rate of flow into the casing can be controlled. The pressure will depend on the relative quantities of gas and liquid in the tubing and casing annulus. As the water level is depressed farther and farther down the annulus, the point is reached, as shown in this illustration, where the entire casing tubing annulus is filled with gas. This is just prior to the moment when the gas starts to go into the tubing. The tubing is still completely filled with water and is exerting the 500 pounds back pressure at the bottom of the hole. Although about 20 barrels of water have been produced up to this point, this water has all come out of the casing annulus and there has been no flow from the producing sands. Now there is about 490 PSI gas pressure on the casing tubing annulus at the surface. At this point, gas starts entering the tubing and rising to the surface with the water, as shown by the small yellow bubbles on the drawing. This causes a reduction in the pressure gradient of the liquid column in the tubing. The flow rate will also be increased somewhat and this flow increase causes a small pressure increase. The reduction in the static gradient is by far the overriding factor. So that now there is a drop in bottom hole pressure opposite the producing sand. The amount of drop depends upon the rate at which the gas is being injected. First, assume that gas is injected at the rate of 10,000 cubic feet per day. It's very complicated mathematically to determine what the pressure gradient in the tubing will be with both gas and water flowing. However, from research done in the industry, gradient curves are available so that the pressure gradient can be estimated. In this case, with 10,000 cubic feet per day of gas being injected, the pressure at the bottom of the hole will drop to about 275 PSI. The drop is shown on the graph at right. This means that the gas pressure on the casing will drop at the surface to about 265 PSI. Since the pressure at the bottom of the hole is lower than the 500 PSI static reservoir pressure by 225 PSI, the well will be producing at 225 barrels per day because the production index of the well is one barrel per PSI. The gradient in the tubing will look something like the curve of the graph from 50 PSI on the surface to 275 PSI on the bottom. So to summarize a moment, the formation is now flowing because the pressure gradient in the tubing has been reduced below that of the reservoir pressure by injecting gas into the casing tubing annulus. In this case, the tubing pressure gradient has been reduced to about 275 PSI. Since the reservoir pressure is 500 PSI, or 225 PSI above the tubing pressure, the well flows at the rate of 225 barrels per day. We've just seen what happens when gas is injected at the rate of 10,000 cubic feet per day. Now, suppose that the gas injection rate is increased to 25,000 cubic feet per day. This increase in gas rate causes a further reduction in the pressure at the bottom of the hole. The gradient in the column is being reduced, although again the increased rate of flow in both liquid and gas causes some increase in friction as the liquids and gas flow up the tubing. With an increase in the gas injection rate to 25,000 cubic feet per day, the pressure will drop to about 225 PSI at the bottom of the hole. The required casing pressure to inject gas will be about 215 PSI, and the well will now produce at a rate of about 275 barrels per day. If the gas injection rate is increased again, this time to 60,000 cubic feet per day, then the bottom hole pressure is about 200 PSI. The surface gas pressure required is about 190 PSI, and the well produces about 300 barrels per day. If this gas rate is doubled to 120,000 cubic feet per day, the pressure is dropped only by an additional 5 PSI at the bottom of the hole. Therefore, the well produces 305 barrels, and the gas pressure at the surface is about 185 PSI. Notice here that the additional increase of gas only slightly reduces the gradient, because now friction is starting to become a significant factor.
So doubling the amount of gas results in only a 5 psi drop in bottom hole pressure. To carry this further, notice the conditions that exist if 300,000 cubic feet per day is injected, or two and a half times the previous amount. This increase results in only another 5 psi drop in bottom hole pressure, and the production rate goes up to 310 barrels per day. Finally, suppose the injection rate is doubled again to 600,000 cubic feet per day. Now, the friction effect due to flow at this higher gas rate has caused more pressure drop than reduction in the gradient. The bottom hole pressure has increased to about 210 psi, and the production rate drops back to 290 barrels per day. So, with a very small amount of gas, the well production is increased substantially. However, as the gas rate is further increased, smaller and smaller increases in production result until finally production actually decreases. This table summarizes the amounts of gas injected and the production in barrels per day yielded. For example, 10,000 cubic feet per day shows a production rate of 225 barrels and so on down the column until the maximum production rate of 310 barrels per day is reached with the injection of 300,000 cubic feet of gas per day. Now, suppose that the water being produced has a value of $1 per barrel, and the gas for injection costs 10 cents per thousand cubic feet. The chart shows that the net income is $224 per day when the injection rate is 10,000 cubic feet per day. The income increases to $294 when 60,000 cubic feet per day is injected to produce 300 barrels per day. But when the gas is increased to 120,000 cubic feet, even though the production goes up to 305 barrels, the costs go up $6, and the net income is actually reduced to $293. Further increases substantially reduce the income even more. Therefore, a point to remember in all applications of continuous flow gas lift is that if the gas injected into the well is continually increased, a point will be reached where further increases in gas will actually reduce the production rate rather than increase it. Another fact to remember is that from an economic standpoint, a level will be reached prior to the level where production rates go down, where additional amounts of gas will actually decrease instead of increase the profit potential. This example illustrates the simplest type of gas lift. In many locations, gas lift exactly as described has been profitably applied by simply injecting gas down the tubing casing annulus and flowing back up the tubing, or vice versa. Gas could just as easily be injected down the tubing to allow flow up the casing tubing annulus, depending upon the type of well and the production rates to be made. However, this simple method does not work in all cases. To explain why, we must look at what happens to the casing pressure when gas is injected and the well starts to produce. First, the pressure is bled into the casing tubing annulus. This pressure increases as the fluid level is lowered in the annulus and reaches a maximum pressure of 490 psi just at the time the gas starts to go into the tubing from the annulus. As gas continues to be injected, the casing pressure drops back substantially, such that if 300 barrels per day is being produced, with 60,000 cubic feet being injected, which incidentally is the rate for maximum daily income under the conditions in the example, only 190 psi casing pressure would be applied to the tubing casing annulus. But if the well is deeper, say 6,000 feet instead of 1,000, then the maximum pressure required to get the well flowing is about 2,700 psi. However, in most fields, the pressure available is from perhaps 1,000 to 1,500 psi, which leaves a large deficit, even though the pressure will drop back substantially to some lower figure as the well begins to produce, depending upon the type of well, the production rate, and many other factors. Now let's go back to that 1,000-foot well that we've been talking about and see what this deficit means. Suppose that only 250 psi gas were available for injection. If this pressure limitation were not taken into account and the tubing run to bottom anyway, 
Gas could be injected until a liquid level of 450 feet in the casing tubing annulus is reached. But at this point, nothing further could be accomplished. There's not enough pressure available to get the gas farther down the annulus. We would be stymied. Suppose that instead of running the tubing all the way to the bottom, it's run down to 450 feet. Or the tubing could be run to bottom, but with a hole in the tubing at 450 feet through which gas could be injected, as shown here. If this is done, gas can be injected at 450 feet, and the pressure at that point would be reduced to about 120 psi due to the gas-liquid gradient above the tubing. But below this point, only well fluids would come into play, which in this case is salt water with no produced gas. Thus, with a pressure gradient of 0.45 psi per foot, the bottom hole pressure would be about 365 psi. The well will produce about 135 barrels per day under these conditions. When the pressure is reduced to 120 psi at 450 feet, liquids will start to U-tube out of the casing into the tubing to a greater depth. From the diagram, notice that the fluid level is depressed now to about 750 feet. Suppose that the hole in the tubing that was made earlier at 450 feet could now be plugged up and a new one made at 750 feet. This means that the pressure at 750 feet would be reduced to about 175 psi and about 215 barrels per day will be produced. In both the examples with the hole in the tubing at 450 feet, and with a hole at 750 feet, the same amount of gas is being injected. But the extra 80 barrels production comes from the fact that gas is being injected 300 feet deeper. To carry this illustration farther, suppose now the magic hole in the tubing is moved down 940 feet. The result is that the pressure would be further reduced so that the bottom could be reached and gone around with the gas. After bottom is reached, the hole at 940 feet would have to be plugged. So now we've seen how gas, even at a lower pressure, can be injected in a progressive manner, on down to the bottom of a well. Obviously, there's no way you can go crawling around down a five and a half inch hole, making and then plugging up holes in tubing. But perhaps just as obviously, you can figure there must be a way to do it, or we wouldn't have spent the time talking about it. So the question now is, how is this process accomplished? It's done with the use of gas lift valves like these. A gas lift valve does not physically cause a pressure reduction in the bottom of the well. There is no jetting through the valve or any type of mechanism. The valve is simply a means to accomplish from the surface openings and closings in the tubing just as we've described. Let's look at how a gas lift valve works. Almost all valves fall into one of two categories. They're either pressure operated or differential valves. First, let's look at pressure operated valves. The diagram shows a simple back pressure regulator. There's a spring forcing the valve closed against the seat. The yellow upstream or casing pressure is pushing against the underside of the diaphragm trying to compress the spring and push the valve open. Also note that the red downstream or tubing pressure is pushing against the bottom of the valve. But the diaphragm is much larger than the stem, so most of the opening effect on the valve is caused by the upstream pressure and only a minor part by the downstream pressure. In this case, it's a back pressure valve. If the direction of flow were reversed, the downstream pressure would have the major effect and it would be a reducing regulator. Gas lift valves in a well are like the illustration and have some sensitivity to both casing and tubing pressure. Here is a typical pressure operated valve used in a gas lift well. To get a better idea of how this valve operates, let's look at it as it might appear in position in a well. This drawing of the valve reveals several facts. The yellow pressure represents casing pressure being supplied from a gas line at the surface. The tubing pressure is represented as the red pressure. The pressure element, which is a pressure charged bellows, is the green. This pressure charged element is creating a force trying to keep the valve closed. Casing pressure acts against the bellows area, 
less the stem area, and tubing pressure acts against the stem area to try to push the valve open. Thus, the valve can be caused to come open by increasing the casing pressure, or increasing the tubing pressure, or some combination of both. In most gas lift valves, the bellows area is from 5 to 25 times the area of the stem. Thus, the pressure acting on the bellows area is the predominant force causing the valve to come open. And the pressure acting against the stem, in this case, tubing pressure, exerts only a minor effect. This valve is called a normal casing pressure operated valve. Fluid operated valve is the name applied to this same type valve, except that the flow stream is reversed, so that the tubing pressure acts against the larger bellows area, and casing pressure operates against the stem. In a fluid operated valve, the well flowing pressure in the tubing is the primary means of controlling whether the valve is open or closed, and the casing pressure exerts only a minor effect. The type well we're trying to produce and the type control we're trying to exert will dictate whether we select a casing pressure operated or fluid operated valve. The next illustration shows a typical pressure charged gas lift valve. There's a dome area in the top of the valve that is pressurized inside, usually with nitrogen. There's a flexible bellows extending down to the valve stem, which opens and closes the valve. The amount of pressure to place in the dome is determined ahead of time, depending upon what casing and tubing pressures it's planned to operate at, and the temperature that the valve is going to be at in the hole. The closing force exerted against the valve can be provided with a spring, as well as a pressure dome, as shown in this example. However, a bellows must be there so that a differential area is provided for the casing and tubing pressure to act against. The spring, in this case, provides the same closing force that was provided in the previous example by the pressure-charged bellows area. Although it's not shown here, a check valve is placed downstream of the valve to prevent surges of flow back through the valve when the well is being opened up and closed. Most check valves installed in the field will not prevent leakage, but are designed only to prevent large surge flows from occurring. If high pressure is placed on the tubing, check valves can normally not be counted on to prevent this pressure being transmitted to the casing. A differential valve works on a different principle from a pressure operated valve. To see how it's different, let's look at this drawing. Whereas a pressure operated valve has a built in closing force, a differential valve as shown in the illustration has a built in opening force. The spring is trying to force the valve open. Thus the differential valve laid out on the table at atmospheric pressure will always be open. Note that casing pressure shown in yellow is tending to act against the valve to close it and tubing pressure shown in red is tending to open it. The valve derives its name from the fact that when the differential between casing and tubing pressure drops below a preset amount, then the valves will open and allow gas to enter the casing. The major disadvantage of a differential valve, and the reason they're not commonly used, is that the valve will close when the differential exceeds a set amount. Therefore, this set amount is the maximum differential that can be created between casing and tubing at some point up to the hole. Further, differential valves require very close spacing in order to unload down the hole. However, the major use of differential valves is for the operating valve in one side of the dual gas lift installation. A gas lift valve is mounted in a mandrel, which is part of the tubing string. Two common types of mandrels will be shown. First, the conventional mandrel here has the gas lift valve mounted outside the tubing string in the casing tubing annulus with protectors built on to prevent damage to the valve when it's run in and out of the casing. This type valve cannot be changed out without pulling tubing. A second type of mandrel is the wire line removable side pocket mandrel as shown in this sketch. In this case, the side pocket mandrel is placed in the tubing string and the valve can be run on wire line and placed in the side pocket area. This still allows full opening through the tubing string. The side pocket mandrel is much more expensive than the conventional mandrel and is run in those installations where there's a high cost or some strong reason for not wanting to pull tubing. 
such as in marine locations and in dual well setups. There are other types of mandrels, but the conventional and side pocket types like we've just seen are the most common. A pressure measurement is the primary method for surveillance on gas lift wells. This may be accomplished with either a surface pressure recorder, like the one here, or with a downhole flowing pressure survey, depending upon well conditions. Pressure measurements allow us to determine if the operation is normal and what the problem may be if the operation is abnormal. When a gas lift valve is being kicked off, much valuable information can be obtained from a two-pin pressure recorder located at the surface and making a record of the casing and tubing pressures. Here's a chart which was made during unloading of a gas lift well. Actually, in this illustration, a three-pin recorder is being used to record tubing pressure, shown in red, casing annulus pressure in blue, and gas line pressure ahead of the choke control in yellow. At approximately time four on the chart, note that the gas is open to the casing tubing annulus, and the well was apparently being unloaded to a pit at the wellhead. Unloading goes on for approximately an hour and a half, and then the well is turned into a separator. The heading action, shown by the fluctuations in the tubing pressure, is a result of the fact that gas can be bled into the casing at a lower rate than through a valve when it comes open. Consequently, the top valve opens and lifts the liquid that has been U-tubed above the valve to the surface, but the drain of gas from the casing tubing annulus causes the pressure to drop and the valve goes closed. These heading cycles go on for approximately two hours, becoming steadily smaller and smaller as the well itself starts to produce more and more fluid. Finally, at approximately time eight on the chart, the well starts to produce steadily with a gas injection pressure of about 520 PSI and a tubing back pressure of about 150 PSI. It would appear that this well is being produced from the first and second gas lift valve. Another example of unloading is shown here. At approximately 1 p.m. on the chart, the well was placed on production. Note the buildup of casing pressure as the liquid is U-tubed. The flow coming out of the tubing in this case is being produced to a separator with 60 PSI back pressure. At approximately 3.30 p.m., gas starts through the top valve, causing the first slug as the tubing is unloaded down to the first valve. Again, note the typical cycling operation until at approximately 7 p.m., where two things happen. One, a larger kick on the gas lift return from the tubing occurs. Two, the casing pressure operates at a slightly lower level. Whereas the well had been operating at approximately 700 PSI, the pressure level now drops to about 680. This indicates that the second valve is uncovered, and the well is now operating from the second valve down in the hole. At approximately 10.30 p.m., something occurs that is typical of what can happen on a gas lift well. At this time, it was decided to leave the well unattended, but apparently there was some concern that the well might come in and start producing at excessive rates. Consequently, a small choke was installed in the tubing return. We see this by the fact that the tubing pressure jumped up to approximately 400 PSI and continued at this high level. Notice the steady casing gas pressure from this time, indicating that the second valve, or perhaps even the top valve, is being held open by the combination of casing pressure and high tubing back pressure. From this point until the following morning when the chart was removed, no further unloading occurred. Gas is simply being cycled down the casing and back up through the tubing through either the first or second valve. This not only points up how a small choke can cause back pressure and limit the well working down to the proper operating valve, but further illustrates that even after the well is down to the operating valve, any choke placed at the wellhead will cause additional back pressure and cause the well to make less production. Thus, at all times, an attempt should be made to maintain the minimum wellhead back pressure at the Christmas tree. Once a well is producing, the primary means of determining whether proper operation is being obtained from the gas lift system is by running a flowing pressure survey. This consists of running a pressure bomb in the well and making stops at each of the gas lift valves. A typical gas lift survey is shown in this figure. Valves are located at approximately 4,500, 6,000, 7,350, 8,400, and 9,300 feet. 
the available gas lift pressure is shown on the line designated P sub C. Approximately 1,250 PSI is available at the wellhead, and the greater pressure with depth is shown by the straight line. Notice the near straight line gradient in the tubing from the surface down to 6,000 feet, and then the sharp break in the line at this point, showing a gradient approaching that of salt water from 6,000 feet on down to the bottom of the hole. This well was producing approximately 700 barrels per day with a formation gas to liquid ratio of about 130. The well had 340,000 cubic feet per day of injection gas, giving a total gas to liquid ratio above the point of injection of approximately 600. The point of gas injection through the valve at 6,000 feet is clearly evident. It can also be seen that this is normal operation because there is insufficient pressure available to inject gas at the point of the next valve. Thus, we simply have to produce what we can get by injecting gas at 6,000 feet. We also can see that if we had higher gas lift gas pressure available, we could produce additional quantities of fluid from this well. Okay. The next chart shows another survey on a gas lift well and clearly shows the point of gas injection to be at the top valve at approximately 2,100 feet. It's also evident that sufficient gas pressure is available through the second and third valve down the hole, and consequently the top valve must be stuck open or cut out. Actually, in this case, changing out the top valve increased production from the well from approximately 600 barrels per day total liquids, of which 30 barrels was oil, to about 850 per day total liquid, of which 60 barrels was oil. The next example shows another case in which injection with the available gas lift gas could be made lower in the hole. In this case, with a well depth of 7,850 feet, gas is being injected through the bottom valve located at 5,000 feet. By putting valves deeper in the hole, we certainly could inject gas all the way to the bottom of the hole. However, if we sort of mentally project the gradient line onto the bottom of the hole, we can see that we probably would not get the pressure at the bottom of the hole lower than perhaps 700 PSI, as opposed to the present 1,000 PSI. Since the static pressure is 2,660 PSI, and we're currently pulling the well down 1,660 PSI, we would not expect very much additional increased production by lowering the point of gas injection. In the case of this well, the problem was one of well bore restriction. An acidizing job resulted in about 50% increase in production from the well. This flowing survey shows that the point of gas injection is at about 4,500 feet, with gas lift valves available above and below that point. However, there is no gas lift valve at 4,500 feet. There is a valve at 4,100 and at 5,000. This indicates that a hole in the tubing exists at 4,500 feet, and of course, gas is being injected through it. Production was approximately 150 barrels per day total fluid, and by simply running a pack off on a wire line inside the tubing and packing off the hole in the tubing, the well worked on down to a lower valve. Thus, production was increased to 450 barrels per day total fluid, or three times the liquid rate from the well with no additional increase in injected gas. To summarize, Continuous flow gas lift is simply allowing the well to flow by increasing the gas to liquid ratio. If the well were making the amount of gas being injected, plus formation gas, there would be no point in gas lifting. The well will produce at the rate that we're producing it. The entire purpose of gas lift is to reduce the pressure at the bottom of the hole so that the inflow from the formation can be maximized. The gas lift valve itself serves no purpose other than being a hole in the tubing which can be controlled. It can be made to open and close based on tubing and casing pressures. The gas lift valve has to serve two functions. It must be located sufficiently close to the valve above it such that we can U-tube down through it and be able to work our gas injection to the lowest possible point so as not to reach a stymied condition. And we must be capable of closing a valve when the one below it has gas going through it. It's extremely important that we maintain the absolute minimum possible back pressure at the wellhead against a gas lifting well. Also, when the well is not producing at the rates anticipated, or when problems are suspected, the most reliable tool for determining what the problem is, 
is a producing bottom hole pressure survey with a pressure taken at or close to each of the gas lift valves in the hole. This allows us to plot a flowing pressure profile in the well and determine the point of gas injection. Further, it should be emphasized that there is a maximum amount of gas that should be put in any well. Putting additional gas in the well can cost us more money than the benefits obtained through increased production. And if carried to the limit, we reach the point where the injection of additional gas will cause a reduction in the production rate rather than an increase.